Hello everyone, Professor Bannock here to talk to you about Kant's groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. And in this particular video, I don't want to go into a whole lot of depth on the text itself. We'll do that at later points. The idea here is to give you some broad understanding of why this is such an important book in the history of philosophy and in particular the history of ethics. Kant is a paradigmatic thinker of the Enlightenment, that is of the modern understanding uh, think for yourself, question authority, the enthusiasm for reason to find some universal principles of application. Part of the Enlightenment package is the idea that humanity will find its own inner essence through the use of reason and not through some mythological self-understanding. With Kant we see the dying embers of the ability of religion and mythology to have a hold over the human mind and to guide our self-conception. Kant argues that it's outside the limits of human understanding to know about God or the immortality of the soul. All legitimate use of the human understanding for Kant should be somehow referenced back to the world of sensible perception, but we can't perceive God, we can't perceive the soul. These are things that not, cannot be empirically verified, which leaves ethics in a tough bind. Because if the world is, can be described by a closed set of causal rules, then it seems that all of our actions would also be involved in this closed causal set, and that we would therefore have no real choice over our actions beyond the machinations of physical causal determinism. So how can we think of ourselves as beings bound by a moral law? The ancients worked with this by arguing that we are bound to moral laws. Moral laws have authority over us because they articulate our natural striving. We naturally strive toward the end of flourishing and moral virtues are what constitute human flourishing. Put simply, the ancient virtue ethicists held that moral laws have their hold on us because there are means to happiness. But Kant wants to find the genuine content of self-reflection when we, when we reflect on ourselves as moral beings, what is it that we find? And he thinks that agency is not only a matter of our drives and our desires. Achieving an understanding of ourselves as agents does not merely mean seeing our actions as a product of our wants and desires. But in self-reflection, we link those actions back to ourself as their author. What we want and what we choose are two different things. Therefore, the will is a separate faculty of the human spirit, distinct from this faculty of drives and desires, and also distinct from the rational or cognitive capacity. Thus, Kant emphasizes the importance of the will as its own faculty, not part of our reasoning, not part of our desire, but of its own volition. The real content of self-reflection on ourselves as moral agencies comes about when what reason tells our will to do is different from what our desire. So when we're in one of those moments of self-conflict where we see ourselves about to perform an action that doesn't seem to fit in with our reasonable conception of ourselves. The moment of moral perception is when your desires are trying to determine your will or your faculty of choice against what reason tells you you ought to be able to do. Thus, in moral reflection, the self discovers that an act ought to be done even if what one wants to do is to go in the other direction. Thus, in our unthinking, unreflective states, our desires tend to determine our will, what we, we do what we want to do. And in the moment of moral self-reflection, we halt the determination of the will by the desire. We think, who am I? What kind of being ought I to be? We then notice that there's something we ought to do, some moral command that we should put in place, but we might not. We might go the other direction. We might identify with the desires and let our, our desires determine our will. Thus, the binding force of moral laws is one of obligation, not of causal determination. So we find ourselves subject to two laws. 
So in order to be obligated by a moral moral law, but not physically necessitated by it, the self then comes to conceive of itself as capable of failing to abide by a moral law. Moreover, one sees oneself as capable of contravening one's desires, one's instincts, one's inclinations that one is naturally drawn towards, therefore conceives of oneself as having a will that is possibly determined by nothing but respect for the moral law. One's capacity for choice is then understood as being something over and above the natural ends towards which one strives. Thus the deep problem for Kant with Aristotle's ethics, the idea that the good is that at which we, nor we the idea that the good or the flourishing life is that at which we naturally strive, for Kant, what we naturally strive towards is encoded in our desires, and it's the moments where we see ourselves as someone who can act solely for respect of the moral law, which is a set of laws distinct from the laws of nature, that we come to see ourselves as beings obligated by morality. The self then can come to see respect for the moral law as the highest intention or highest motive for action. For acting out of respect for the moral law is the only way for the will to go above and beyond its natural desires and inclinations and see itself as a being capable of choice that is a being that's free. If we follow all of our desires, then we're being determined by instinct, determined by causes outside of ourselves. We might as well be an ant or a bee following its every natural whim. It's in the moments of self-reflection when we see that what we ought to do conflicts with what we want to do, that we can then conceive of ourselves as a being capable of choice. That is to say, we have to conceive of ourselves as free in order for moral laws to have their hold on us. So Kant connects the whole idea of morality, laws of spirit, laws of ethics, with freedom rather than with happiness. Intuitively, that makes sense. We can conceive of someone who, uh, whose moral obligations actually work against their own happiness. If we focus one-sidedly on our own happiness, according to Kant, that can actually draw us away from our duty and therefore draw us from what we should, in reflection, find to be the highest principle of morality, respect for duty, respect for our obligations. For Kant, the consideration of ourselves as moral beings must lead to the insight that we have to conceive of ourselves as free beings or else the idea of being obligated by moral laws makes no sense. We can't have obligations if we have no capacity for choice. We can't have genuine capacity for choice if all of our choices are driven by our natural tendencies. Then we are merely determined by those natural tendencies, even in the best case when we have developed the virtues. As a result, freedom for Kant can't simply mean doing whatever you want undeterministically without law. It precisely rather means acting in a way that's handed down by the moral law rather than the mere laws of nature. Kant's emphasis on the freedom of our will and the possibility that we are autonomous beings not controlled by nature or by God has vast implications for our understanding of ourselves and our, our position in the universe, we have to be able to conceive of ourselves consistently in reflection as free beings in order for moral obligations to have their intelligibility. Now freedom could consist in the capacity to do otherwise. I'm free to lift my arm if I might not have done it. I hear I'm lifting my arm, it's my choice because I might not have done it. I have the capacity to keep my arm down. Kant also forces us to grapple with perhaps a deeper conception of freedom on which we have the capacity for an evil will. That is, we're free in the sense that we can make ourselves into something. We can make ourselves into something with a good will, that capacity for choice that's driven by goodness, by the moral law, or we can make ourselves into the kind of being whose will is evil. Aristotle said all actions aim at some good, therefore it's been beautifully said that the good is that at which all things aim. So when we aim at our target, we are aiming at the good, we always aim at what we perceive to be good, even if we're mistaken and we don't perceive correctly, 
all willing, all choosing has to be aimed by definition at some good. On such an account, evil is merely negative. It's merely a weakness or a hindrance or a falling short. And when we miss the target, that's evil. It's a, it's, evil is purely a negation or a lack. It has no positive being of its own. It's not as though there's a good target here and a separate target over here. No, evil is merely the falling short of where we're aiming at. So for Aristotle, we're all naturally striving towards the good, whereas in Kant, we come to see man as a being capable of setting its will towards evil, of what could be called radical evil, that is, evil that penetrates to the very root of who we are. In previous philosophies, it was possible to consider ourselves as essentially good beings that sometimes fall short due to weakness. So often evil was associated with inessential parts of ourselves. When, when we do evil, when we don't fully identify with who we really are, the internal rationality or the internal spirit. For Kant, goodness is a free choice. The goodwill is the metric of all moral judgment. What, what we find on self-reflection to be good, to be the highest good, is when we in fact had a good will, but we don't always have a good will. Thus on these previous Aristotelian conceptions, evil has a kind of function in reality. After all, if everything was equally good, nothing fell short, nothing had any imperfection, then there'd be no discernible difference between God and the world. Moreover, we could then, moreover, we can then suppose that evil always has a role to play by bringing out more sharply, by contrast, the good. The way that a shadowy part of a painting only serves to highlight the beauty of the colorful part all the more. The sobering point that we find in Kant is Kant's conception of the fallout of the Enlightenment. What we have to understand when we're trying to conceive of ourselves as rational rather than as beings that are fully transparent in a, in a religion is that we are genuinely alone, that we're capable of making ourselves into something evil, that what we become is the result of our own choices, and those choices may not be redeemable. In order to understand ourselves as moral beings, we have to understand ourselves as free and therefore as capable of contravening morality, of genuinely becoming evil. Evil is not merely a falling away of who we are, but an always open possibility of who we actually are. The being who has a self-determining will is also fully held over the abyss of making itself into something that it no longer recognizes. The good will cannot be assumed. We have to think of ourselves as the kind of being who gambles with its good will every time it makes a decision based on its own inclinations.